This is an artist's concept of the very first flight made by man, five miles across the roofs of Paris in 1783. It's been a long time technologically from that first manned flight in a Montgolfier hot air balloon by Pilatre de Rogier and the Marquis d'Arland. Yet today's space flights and manned spacecraft, like this Apollo command module, would not be possible without the knowledge gained from balloon flights, particularly in the 1930s. In 1783, it was a famous pair of brothers named Montgolfier who finally succeeded in enabling man to realize one of his oldest dreams, that of soaring above the ground. And about 150 years later, it was another famous pair of brothers who developed the forerunners of today's pressurized spacecraft. August and Jean Picard. The Picard brothers invented and designed a bathyscaphe for deep sea research, utilizing a pressurized cabin and artificial atmosphere for the first time. Years later, Applying the same techniques, they constructed a gondola to be carried by a hydrogen balloon to the opposite extreme, the stratosphere. This was the first use of an environmental control system in flight. As one approaches the stratosphere, which begins at about 35,000 feet, the air becomes much too thin to support life. A supply of air must therefore be taken along in the aircraft. The Picard balloon flights led to the development of the complete environmental control systems, without which space flight would not be possible. Today, such systems are used not only in the cabins of spacecraft, but also in the pressurized space suits worn by the astronauts both inside the spacecraft for survival when it is not pressurized and outside during extravehicular activity. The doctors Picard also pioneered the development of other devices to make possible man's explorations high above ground. For example, pyrotechnic devices These are explosive systems used for many purposes in space flight. Separating launch stages and modules of spacecraft, cutting the lines of parachutes after they've served their purpose during re-entry. Blowing open the adapter, which protects the lunar module during launch and early flight. In the Apollo spacecraft, there are more than 100 such pyrotechnic systems. The first aircraft pyrotechnics were used to cut loose ballast and to cut the ropes holding the balloon to the ground before liftoff in one of the most significant flights in history. This took place on October 23, 1934. The flight was directed by Dr. Jean Picard. He was an organic chemist and planned the mission for the primary purpose of obtaining data on cosmic rays. He was not a balloon pilot, but he had one very attractive asset to call upon for help in getting him and his radiation instruments into the stratosphere, his wife. It is my pleasure now, a few years later, to introduce this lady, also a PhD, who was our country's first licensed woman balloonist, Dr. Jeanette Picard. It's a pleasure having you with us, Dr. Picard. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. One has only to look at the model of this Apollo spacecraft to realize how far Man's space flight has come in these past few years. Tell me, Dr. Picard, you earned your doctor's degree in education. How in the world, or perhaps we should say how out of the world, did you become a woman balloonist? Oh, I married the right man at the right time. That's all there is to it. I, uh, oh, if a man needs a, a typist, his wife learns to type. And if uh, he needs a free balloon pilot, why? She learns to fly a balloon. Simple as that. Using some of the newsreel coverage of the event, could you help us turn back a page into this recent past, sort of put us on the scene as you and your husband prepared for and then accomplished that history-making 1934 stratosphere flight? Oh, I should be happy to. I wish the films were a little better. They're very old, of course, and we didn't have uh, color supervision in those days or anything like that. But what I have, I'd be glad to show you. This part of the film shows us with Dr. Swan and Dr. Locker of the Bartow Research Foundation, where most of the scientific instruments were made. We had 168 Geiger counters, 
Dr. Swan is at the right of the picture. There he is in the center with some of the Geiger counters. We had them in banks pointing at different angles. Of course, uh, they make us pose. Now Professor Picard is going to show the ballast releasing device, the pyrotechnic device. He puts on his safety goggles and tapes a blasting cap to a piece of string. The bag is really a large sleeve and he'll tie it shut with this piece of string. Turn it inside out so that the blasting cap is up in the center. Fill it full of sand and hang it on the gondola. Then from inside, with an electric contact, he explodes the blasting cap and the bag punctures very safely. Watch the bottom of the bag and you will see how quickly you can drop 80 pounds of sand. That saved our lives when we came down through the clouds. We are the only people who made a stratosphere flight in the 1930s through clouds, landed through clouds, and lived to tell the tale. The balloon was inflated with 700 cylinders of hydrogen. Just a little gas is needed. This is the difference between a stratosphere balloon and an ordinary balloon. You only put in a little bit of gas in the top of the balloon until it is about one-tenth full. This is part of the crowd that stayed up all night watching us. Now the balloon is fully inflated. It is held by ropes from the upper catenary, which will be released at the moment of flight. We had 300 men, only six of them had ever seen a balloon before. These were all volunteers. Some of the firemen from Gross Point with the famous balloonist Ed Hill as director of ground operations. When Ed Hill signaled, each man walked forward a given amount so that the balloon went up evenly on all sides. And we began to be conscious here of the strain and stress on the balloon. The lower part, the lower catenary, the part below the lower catenary was turned up inside. It was very beautiful to go in under there, under the balloon, like a magnificent cathedral. But the stress on the material would be too great if we took off in the balloon in this way. See how strained it is, how tight it would tear in flight. So we opened the appendix, letting air into it. Then all the folds of the balloon are free and easy. Now, of course, you've got an explosive mixture up there at the top where the air and the hydrogen meet. But nobody's going to go up there, 150 feet, and light a cigarette. And the danger of explosion is less than taking off with a balloon under stress. So they line us up in front of the gondola to say goodbye. Paul, who is there in front, he's my middle son, tells me not to forget the angel food cake. We always take angel food cake with us on a balloon flight. It's just a precaution. We like to have it alone. And then they say, get in the gondola and say goodbye. Of course, the fact that the gondola isn't attached has no interest to the newsman. Then they very carefully move the gondola in under the balloon. The balloon is now held, is attached to the load ring, and the load ring is held by four heavy ropes. You see the white bags there. Each one has a length of TNT, and again the ropes will be cut by exploding the TNT. This is the first use of pyrotechnics in the release of an aircraft. The gondola is now being attached to the load ring by the toggle. Those are my two young sons, Paul and Donald. They were about eight and ten years old. Takeoff will be at 6.58 a.m. at Dearborn, Michigan. Professor Picard is inside, and I'm watching the signals from Ed Hill to know when to cut the four ropes. We're weighing off, taking out a little ballast until we're just light enough. Now you see the ropes angle a little to the side. The balloon has been blown by the wind. You see, as we cut them, we swing down in an arc under the balloon and we almost touch the ground. Get under the balloon and push them up. Get under the balloon and push them up. You see at the top of the picture that as we come in under the balloon, the balloon is free and easy without any strain or stress on the material. The gondola is painted white on the top and black on the bottom to control the temperature. Goodbye, Mother. We have an inside temperature of plus 67 while it was minus 67 outside. 
The gondola is only one eighth inch thick aluminum alloy. We had been rising at the rate of 200 feet a minute. Soon after we got above the clouds, the ambient pressure was so low that our onboard supply of oxygen began boiling too rapidly. We closed the doors to hermetically seal the gondola. Our environmental control system, which we called air conditioning, consisted of the liquid oxygen for breathing, a barometer, thermometer, and leak indicator, an electric fan to circulate the air, silica gel to keep it freshened, alkali to absorb carbon dioxide, and anhydrous magnesium perchlorate to absorb moisture. We tested the air throughout for purity, and it was in very good condition, less than 0.05%. Stratosphere balloon calling the Earth. We get no answer. Radios weren't very advanced then. Now here you see the shoreline of Lake Erie. Clouds over the lake are higher than over the land. We couldn't see it as well as that. Here we are, 35,000 feet. These two pictures were taken by Captain Stevens at 15,000 feet and showed the shoreline of Lake Erie and showed us. Now we valved gas at our top altitude to start down and the pictures are taken through the top window of the gondola and show how the balloon breathes as the air forces its way in through the open appendix that is held open by a metal ring so that we landed really with a hot air balloon. Here we've gradually worked our way down to the tops of the clouds and from the tops of the clouds we listened. We bounced along over the tops of the clouds below 10,000 feet. The door, the hatch was open and we listened for what was underneath. Finally we came down through the clouds and dropped 800 pounds of ballast landing in some trees that punctured the balloon. The last entry in a post-flight record that I prepared expressed my feelings at the time. Everything is over. Everything that is except the gathering up of our equipment and the fragments of our once beautiful balloon. Dr. Picard, as the balloonist pilot on that flight, you kept a detailed log and other records. I think your list of pre-liftoff tasks or countdown is especially interesting, may I? It reads, load Millikan lead, load lead ballast, place rug, wipe windows. Everything changes but the eternally feminine. Oh, there was nothing feminine about that. That's the safety engineer. You don't take off with dirty windows or uh, windows that will frost up. Did you have trouble from the frost? No, we didn't, because uh, an invention of Professor Picard's, which resulted later in a frost-free windshield for airplanes, and it saved the lives of many of our pilots over Germany in World War II. And that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. yes. Dr. Picard, that 1934 flight was over, carried on successfully, but your career as a balloonist was really just beginning. Could you tell us about some of your and Professor Picard's later projects? There are two or three in particular that might be interesting. Since we have the same type of film coverage, black and white, as we had on the first film. This balloon was built at the University of Minnesota, the first balloon made of cellophane. It is not a spherical balloon like the regular old balloons were. The top half of it is spherical and the lower half is conical. The load is carried on the appendix itself by a rope attached directly to the appendix. This is an automatic ballast releasing device. As the balloon goes down, you see, the stopcock opens. If the balloon goes up, then the leaf closes the stopcock and the sand stops running. So this is an automatic method of releasing ballast. This is Professor Picard, who was on the faculty, and Professor Ackerman, who was head of the Department of Aeronautical Engineering at the University of Minnesota in 1936, examining this first cellophane balloon on the table where we built it in the laboratory. Dr. Gilruth, who was to become director of the Manned Spacecraft Center, and Mrs. Gilruth were both students at the University of Minnesota and both participated in the construction of this balloon and in launching it. 
In this scene, Dr. Gilruth is just another boy, and you cannot recognize him. But Mrs. Gilruth is the girl, and is the only girl there. So there is no difficulty about recognizing Jean Barnhill, who later became Mrs. Gilruth. A lot of people don't realize that Mrs. Gilruth herself became a graduate aeronautical engineer, and a very capable one. They are attaching the manifold. Professor Picard and Jean put the gas in. We were given a very special privilege. We were actually allowed to use the football field. We stepped on the grass that the football players step on to send this balloon up. Now the gas is going into it, and again it's inflated like the stratosphere balloons, with only a small amount of gas at the top, and the rest of the balloon is uninflated. But there are no holding ropes here, no upper catenary for inflation, no lower catenary to hold the load, so that the least bit of wind, occasionally a very slight gust of wind, would blow the whole uninflated part out to make a great big sail. Now this, of course, was a small balloon. It's only 30 feet high, so that it was easy for the students to hold it. But with modern balloons, the smallest of which are about 250,000 cubic feet, and they go up to 13 million, the uninflated part forms a sail that is just impossible to hold. You can't hold a 200-foot sail in a two-mile wind, you know. It just blows away from you. And you see here a little gust of wind, and the students are having quite a lot of trouble holding, but they are able to do so. Now this carried radio equipment, measured the temperature, pressure, and humidity of the air throughout the flight, radioing it back to the ground. And it flew. This balloon went up to 50,000 feet, leveled off, and stayed there through 600 miles, then came down into Arkansas from Minnesota. The balloon is made of gores of material, rather like sections of orange peelings. The gores were fastened together with scotch tape on this first one. Later, the gores were heat sealed as well as taped. Now, of course, cellophane cracks in the cold. So we were fortunate to do this in the spring in fairly warm, humid weather. It was successful. This was the first successful flight of a plastic film balloon that leveled off and went with its payload for a considerable distance. Another project was called the Pleiades, based on the proven theory that several small balloons will weigh less than a single large balloon and have more lift. For this, we built a basket, not of wicker as usual, but of metal and the radios were a little bit better. Two latex balloons were inflated by one cylinder. Each balloon was in a box, ready to fly. Again, we had a volunteer ground crew, just people. And we had a hundred balloons with three men to two balloons. Each balloon was fastened by its own string to the load ring or to a rope that stood 50 feet above the load ring, attached to the load ring. They were very beautiful, these white, cream-colored, glistening balloons. They were like a magnificent pearl necklace as they stretched around the circle. Each balloon was inflated. One balloon until it lifted five pounds and the other balloon until it lifted six pounds. You see how magnificent the pearl necklace surrounding the balloon and the basket.
and each balloon was gradually released. It would have been better to just let them go, and they could have come up, I think, more evenly, instead of releasing them gradually until they got one under the other. There you see the two clusters, and a little later you will get a side view. Now, in order to valve gas, because there was no valve in this thing, in order to replace the valving of gas, you either cut a string, but there was danger of its catching and tangling, or you pulled the balloon down and stabbed it with a knife, or took a pistol and just shot it. Now you have to be careful and shoot at the side. If these are partially inflated and you hit one in the center, the balloon will just stand there and smile at you. You can see the hole go right through the middle of the balloon, and the balloon doesn't pop. This is a silly looking contraption, but it worked. In 1947, when new plastics were available, we started what was called Project Helios. This was the first successful inflation of one of these 250,000 cubic foot polyethylene balloons. Here we enclosed the lower part, the uninflated part, in a sheath so that it would not be subject to the wind. The sheath was pulled off at the moment of flight. Well, of course, the first day that we made a test of this inflation with the sheath, we had a calm, a really perfectly dead calm. No wind at all. So that once the balloon was up in the air, we walked with it and we ran with it, just to show that you could get some wind pressure against the thing and still hold it. This was a, quote, classified project, unquote, at the time. See there, we're walking with it, and now they're running. There's an automatic ripping device on it, so that the moment the balloon was in the air, 100 feet up or so, it was ripped and brought right down on the same property. As it comes down, you can see how much material goes into one of these comparatively small balloons. Now we begin to get a little color film. This is a few days later. We had chosen a day when there was some wind, I think eight to 10 miles an hour. And this is the part that is going to be fully inflated. It was difficult to hold it, but as soon as there was enough gas in it, it steadied itself. But on this day, as soon as we let it up, as soon as we had the sheath off, we had to let it go because there was just too much power on it. And then we ripped it down. Project Helios was terminated not long after. So the multiple plastic film aerostat was not built and flown after all. Of course, balloon exploits today go far beyond our experimental flights. NASA, for example, has used a 26 million cubic foot balloon to sustain the Voyager spacecraft in testing its Mars landing system and environmental control systems. Pyrotechnics and instruments in manned spacecraft are far more complex and versatile than those in our early gondolas. But like the hundreds of thousands of men and women throughout the United States working in the space program, one gets a very rewarding feeling to realize that he has helped give history a little nudge forward toward the wonders of the future. You know, I like to quote August Picard here, where he says that to climb the highest mountains, to discover new countries, to wander into limitless space, or to throw a searchlight into the realms of eternal darkness, is what makes life worth living.